हेलो गाइस हाउ आर यू आई एम हरदीप सिंह वेलकम बैक टू योर ओन यूट्यूब चैनल आल्स अपडेट्स एंड रीसेंट एग्जाम्स फॉर मोर अपडेट्स रिलेटेड टू रीसेंट आल्स एग्जाम राइटिंग दस टॉपिक्स लिस्टनिंग रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट एंड स्पीकिंग क्यू कैट गेस वर्क प्लीज गाइस पार्टिसिपेट इन एवरी डे लिस्टनिंग एंड रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट टू अचीव योर डिजायर बैंड स्कोर इन योर एक्चुअल आल्स एग्जाम Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page Alts Updates and Recent Exams. Part 1. A man wants to place an order by telephone for some office stationery. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Thank you for calling Millennium Office Supplies. If you would like to place an order, please press 1. Your call has been placed in a queue. A customer service operator will be with you shortly. Jean is speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I'd like to order some stationery, please. And who am I speaking to? John Carter. Right. Can I just confirm your account number and the name of your company, John? Sure. The account number is six nine two four double one. Six nine two four one one. Right. And you're from Rainbow Computers.、Uh, no, the company is Rainbow Communications. Oh, okay. I'll just fix that on the system. Communications. And what would you like to order, John?、Uh, envelopes. We need a box of A4. That is normal size envelopes. White, yellow, or Manila.、Um, we'll have the plain white, please.、Uh, but the ones with the little windows. Okay. One box A4 white. Just the one box, was it? Um. On second thoughts, make that two boxes. We go through heaps of envelopes. Um. As a matter of interest, are they made from recycled paper? No, you can't get white recycled paper. The recycled ones are grey, and they're more expensive, actually. Right, we'll stick to white then. Something else, John? Yes, we need some coloured photocopy paper. What colours do you have? We've got purple, light blue, blue, light green, whatever you want, pretty much. There are five hundred sheets to the pack. Right, let's see.、Um, we're going to need a lot of blue paper for our new price lists. So, can you give us ten packs, please? Make sure it's the light blue, though. Ten packs of the light blue. Anything else that we can help you with? Um,、uh, let me think. What else do we need? Ah,、uh, oh, I'm sure there was something else. Pens, paper clips, fax paper, computer supplies, office furniture. Yeah, ah, oh yes, we need floppy disks. Do you have those nice coloured ones? Yes, but they're a bit more expensive than the black ones. Oh, that's all right. I'm not paying anyway. <laughs> right, floppy disks. And what about diaries for next year? We've got them in stock already, and it's a good idea to order early. Um, no, I think we're all right for diaries. But something we do need is one of those big wall calendars. You know, one that shows the whole year at a glance. Do you stock those? We certainly do. Okay, can you include a wall calendar then、uh, with the other stuff? Um, just make sure it's got the whole year on the one side. Sure. And do you have a copy of our new catalogue? No, I don't. But could you send one? Yes, I'll pop one in with the order. 
you'll find it a lot easier to remember what you need if you have our catalogue in front of you next time. Yes, good idea. And um, when can you deliver this? Should be with you tomorrow morning. Can you make sure that it's not after 11.30am? Because I have to go out at 12. There's only myself here on Fridays. Fine. I'll make a note on the delivery docket that they should deliver before half past 11. Thanks very much. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear a reporter talking on the radio about an artist's exhibition. Look at questions 11 to 18. A new collection of artwork is going on show to the public next month in the form of an artist's exhibition. The exhibition will include many different types of art, over a hundred different pieces by 58 artists from the local area. It's being held at the Royal Museum, which, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the area, is located opposite the library in West Street, right on the corner. The actual address is number one Queen's Park Road, it isn't difficult to find. The exhibition will run for nine weeks and will begin on the 6th of October and continue until the 10th of December. So there's plenty of time for you to go along and have a look and I'm sure that will be worth doing. What will you see there? Well, amongst the items on display will be some exciting pieces of modern jewellery, furniture, ceramics, metalwork and sculpture. To give you some examples, local artist Kate Main will be there to discuss her collection of pots and bowls that she has made to resemble garden vegetables. They're the sort of thing that would brighten up any dining table and range from things like yellow cabbage shaped bowls to round tomato shaped teapots. Prize winner Cynthia Corse will also be there to talk about her silver jewellery, all of which she produced using ideas from the rural setting of her country home. Some of her rings are quite extraordinary and have beautiful coloured stones in them. Or, if you prefer sculpture, there's plenty of that too. Take, for example, Susan Cupp's sculpture of 25 pairs of white paper shoes. It sounds easy, but believe me, it looks incredible. All of these items, along with many others, will be on sale throughout the exhibition period. As part of the exhibition, there will be a series of demonstrations called Face to Face, which will take place every Sunday afternoon during the exhibition, and these will provide an opportunity for you to meet the artists. Now look at questions 19 and 20. The second set of activities are for those who would prefer to indulge in some artwork themselves. The Artists' Conservatory are holding a series of courses over the autumn period. The courses cover all media and include subjects such as Chinese brush painting, pencil drawing and silk painting. 
all the tutors are experienced artists. Course sizes are kept to a minimum of 15 and there will be plenty of individual assistance. All the sessions offer excellent value for money and the opportunity to relax in a delightful rural setting. Fees are very reasonable and include the use of an excellent studio and access to the art shop, which you will find sells everything from paper to CDs, and they also include the provision of all materials. For more information on dates, cost and availability, you should get in touch with the programme coordinator on 4592 839 584 or go direct to the website, which you will find is that is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. You will hear a student, Melanie, discussing her proposal for presentation with her tutor. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Right, Mel. You wanted to see me to get some feedback on your proposal and outline for your presentation. I've had a good look through now and I've made a few notes about areas I feel you can improve. I must admit, when I first saw the topic you had chosen, I was a little worried. Really? Yes. Well, it can be difficult to produce something fresh and interesting when you take on a topic like climate change. So much has already been written about it and, well, it's not exactly original. But I have to say, I like the way you've approached the subject matter. Thank you. Yes, I know it's a subject that has probably been chosen many times before and that's why I decided to take a slightly different angle. I decided to base the presentation on an analysis of extreme weather and natural disasters over the last few years. There seems to be plenty of information on the topic and I'll be able to include lots of visual material, photographs, graphs and so on. Yes, I really like the idea and you've produced a clear outline of the main points. Something I am a little concerned about, though, is the order you plan to use them in. I'm not sure it's entirely logical. I think that needs some rethinking. Yes, I did wonder about that. Do you think the section on natural disasters should come later? Yes, but that's not the only thing. Look, I've made some notes and suggested a possible order. Mm, yes, I see what you mean. I did wonder whether I needed to add a section about the recent flooding in parts of Europe. Well, I think you should definitely mention it, but I'm not sure it needs its own section. Mm -hmm. What about including it in the introduction? In my opinion, the introduction is the weakest part. It needs much more substance. Yes, I wasn't sure what to include. Well, you need to grab your audience's attention at the start. And then you should include some background information on the topic and outline your main points. And what's the best way of getting their attention? Well, it could be a surprising or interesting fact, a, a picture or an anecdote. Oh, I know. I found some fantastic pictures on the internet of the flooding. If I can find some statistics about it too, would that be a good way to start? Absolutely. It will show the audience the relevance of your presentation and bring it right up to date. Remember to check the copyright and acknowledge your sources for any visual material you use. Really? For pictures? I didn't realise I had to. Yes, you should acknowledge all your sources in your bibliography and on your slides too. Well, I've already started my bibliography. Yes, I looked at that. Is there a problem? Not exactly. It's good to see you're taking a note of your sources, but there's so many of them. And I'm not sure about the validity of some of these internet sources. How do you mean? Well, take this graph you found. 
about rainfall. Mm -hmm. Couldn't you find a more reliable source? This is taken from someone's blog. You need to make sure all your information is from trusted sources, academic papers, scientific journals, that sort of thing. OK. And I need to cut the number of entries in my bibliography? Only include the sources you actually use and refer to in your presentation. I would say no more than about 10 for this assignment. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. OK, so you're happy with the organisation and content. Plenty to work on there. Now, I believe you had some questions about the actual delivery of the presentation. Yes. Well, it's more the technical side of things, really. I'm not very confident with the equipment and I've never given a presentation before, so I'm really nervous. Well, I think the best way to overcome your nerves is by preparing really thoroughly. Make sure you know the subject matter inside out and that any visual aids and equipment are ready. Yes, I wanted to ask about that. I'm getting a friend to help me put together the slides. Have you any advice about that? The one thing I would say is don't put too much information on your slides, just the main points and any relevant visuals. Mm -hmm. You want your slides to support what you're saying. And I would also keep the slides themselves very simple. No fancy colours or animation that will distract the audience from what you're saying. No sound effects then? No, definitely not. And what you need to do is practice. You'll feel far more confident if you've run through it a few times with a friend. Mm, my friend is going to listen to me run through it. On the actual day of the presentation, there are a few important things to remember. First, think about where you stand. It's vital that you position yourself centrally and make eye contact with your whole audience. Don't forget the people sitting at the sides. Mm -hmm. If you smile and look friendly, it will make your audience feel relaxed too. And don't fidget and move around too much. It can be very distracting. What about my slideshow? I'll need to be near the computer to move the slides forward. Have you thought about using a wireless mouse or keyboard? That will really help. It means you can control the slideshow without having to move or turn your back on the audience every time you change slides. That's a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. The other thing to remember is that when we're nervous, we tend to speak more quickly. So make a real effort to speak calmly and clearly so that your audience understands you and doesn't feel rushed. What about memorising the talk? A friend told me she did that for her presentation, but I don't think she did terribly well. No, it's not a very good idea. It will make you sound unnatural. And don't read from a prepared speech because that will also affect the delivery and stop you making eye contact. Why don't you try using cue cards? You can include all the main points and any key facts or numbers as a memory aid. It will sound far more natural. Hmm. The other thing I'm a little worried about is questions from the audience. Should I answer them immediately or wait till the end? The best thing to do is tell the audience in the introduction that you will answer their questions at the end of the presentation. That way you won't get any distracting interruptions. If you're not sure about the answer, ask the questioner to repeat the question. That will give you thinking time. You could always direct the question back to the questioner or the audience, asking them what they think. Great. Oh, thanks for all your advice. It's been really helpful. No problem. I'm looking forward to your presentation. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. You will hear a lecture from a professor of mathematics. He is talking about the mathematical letter pi. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Today, in the first in the series of talks about significant numbers, I'm going to talk about pi. As a mathematician and engineer, I find many numbers fascinating, but for me, pi is probably the most interesting. So, what is pi? Well, as all of you will probably know, pi is what you get if you divide the circumference of a circle, that's the distance around the outside edge, by its diameter, that's a straight line through its centre. And as most of you will also have learnt in your maths lessons at school, that number is usually calculated to two decimal places, and is commonly recognised as 3.14. But what you might not know is that this number is infinitely long. That is, if you keep on dividing the circumference by the diameter, you get a never-ending number. Pi is sometimes represented as the fraction 22 over 7, which only gives us an approximation of the ratio. This figure has given us in Europe Pi Approximation Day, which is celebrated on the 22nd day of the 7th month, that is, July the 22nd. However, in the United States, World Pi Day is held on March the 14th, which in American date notation is written as 3 over 14, representing the first three figures of the decimal representation of Pi. Many educational institutions hold special events on these days. First, I'll talk a little about the significance of Pi. Pi has fascinated scholars, mathematicians and scientists for thousands of years, and for many, this fascination involves calculating its value with increasing precision. It has numerous practical uses. One of the reasons pi is so well known and studied is that it can be found in so many different formulae. As its ratio relates to circles, it is essential in both trigonometry and geometry, and can also be found in dozens of formulae relating to physics, cosmology, electromagnetism, engineering, geology, probability and statistics. So, let's have a brief look at its history. Well, we have to go right back to the ancient Babylonians to see that some understanding of Pi has been around for a long time. As they were building their city, the ancient Babylonian town planners took a great interest in geometry, and as far back as the 20th century BCE, they discovered that if you divide a circle's circumference by its diameter, you always get a number in the region of 3. Their exact calculation gave this ratio a value of 3.125, which is only half a percent outside the true value of pi. We have numerous historical accounts of pi. One of the earliest dates back to the 2nd century BCE and is on an ancient Egyptian papyrus scroll. This version of pi is in fact a copy of an earlier document and, although not entirely accurate, is within 1% of its true value at 3.160. Over the years, numerous notable mathematicians and scientists have worked on defining the value of pi. The famous Greek scholar Archimedes, working in the 1st century BCE, took a theoretical approach to the study of pi. He devised a system for working out the value of pi using polygons, that is a flat shape with at least three sides or angles. This is why it is sometimes called Archimedes constant. After Archimedes, mathematicians, scientists and astronomers from India, Persia and China attempted to calculate the pi ratio, but it wasn't until the 16th and 17th centuries that the development of infinite series techniques allowed far more precise calculations. It was early the following century that a little-known Welsh mathematician by the name of William Jones, a contemporary and friend of Sir Isaac Newton, actually gave the ratio a name, suggesting pi, after the sixteenth letter of the Greek alphabet. The eighteenth and nineteenth centuries saw two significant breakthroughs for pi. The first was in 1761, when the Swiss mathematician Johann Lambert established that pi is an irrational number. This means that it cannot be expressed as a fraction of two whole numbers. The second breakthrough occurred in 1882, when Ferdinand von Lindemann, a mathematician from Germany, 
demonstrated that pi was transcendental. This means that it is not possible to find a square with an exactly equal area to a given circle. It was another German mathematician, Ludolf van Keulen, who, back at the beginning of the 17th century, calculated pi to 35 decimal places. This achievement really set the ball rolling for the sometimes obsessive quest by mathematicians the world over to find the highest number of digits when calculating pi. Some have devoted years of their lives to this cause, with varying degrees of success. William Shanks, who was not even a professional mathematician, spent around 20 years to calculate pi to 707 decimal places. His achievement was discredited after his death, when it was discovered that he had made a mistake and only the first 527 digits were correct. This error was discovered in 1944, using one of the first digital calculators, and the computer era revolutionised mathematicians' ability to find ever-increasing numbers of digits. Throughout the mid-20th century, the record for the number of digits was broken repeatedly until 1973, when over one million digits was reached. Since then, the record has gone on to be broken a number of times, many of which use multi-million pound computers. The record is now around 10 trillion digits. That's 10 followed by 12 noughts. One of the most notable achievements was by a Frenchman called Fabrice Bellard, who in 2009 developed a new formula to calculate pi, which has subsequently become known as Bellard's formula. This enabled him to calculate pi to 2,700 billion decimal places. What made his achievement so amazing was that the software programmer used his 2,000 pound desktop computer, taking 131 days to complete the calculation. His record has since been broken a number of times. Finally, one other notable achievement that might interest you was by a research student, Lu Chao, who in 2005 memorized and recited pi to 67,890 digits without making a single mistake. The feat took the postgraduate just over 24 hours to complete. So, as you can see, pi is a fascinating number. Moving on now, let's talk a little more about pi's relevance to everyday life. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking QCAD guesswork. Please guys participate in everyday new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired dance score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material, visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my Telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.